Well, welcome to the meeting tonight. I want to thank the brothers at Midland Park for inviting me to speak. And I want to thank also everyone who has tuned in to this broadcast this evening. It's a real pleasure and a privilege really to be able to speak to you. And my subject tonight is going to be a question. Do I love the father or do I love the world? We're going to find out those are mutually exclusive categories so that if you love the father, you do not love the world. And if you love the world, you do not love the father. At least that's how John presents it in his usual black and white polar fashion. But we do want to examine that question. And if you think that it's time for a spiritual spanking, uh, that's really not the tone I want to set tonight. I want to be positive and encouraging, but at the same time challenging as we consider what the word of God says to us. So I'd like to read with you from 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. And hereby do we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. And with that brief section, John gives us one of his famous tests, the test of righteousness. We now move into an extended discussion of the next test, which is John's test of love. Later in the chapter, we have John's third and final category of testing, the testing of truth but we won't read that part because we won't have time to discuss it. Most of our discussion will be centered in this next part we're about to read. So verse seven, brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth, knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven for you forgiven you rather for his name's sake. And I write unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because ye have known the father. I have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written uh, un unto you young men because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And that is my chief text for the evening. John goes on to say, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The next section begins with little children. I want to begin with a few remarks about John's first epistle and comparing it in some ways to his well-known gospel as well and some of the themes that are common to each. John has been often called a family epistle and this family consists of a father, a unique son, and he is the only one who is called son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God and children. And you and I are those children. We are in the family of God. We share a common life, eternal life. We share a common love because as the father loves, so his children love. And we walk in a common light. And those are the words that are so striking in both John's gospel and his epistle. And I want to spend a minute just thinking about life, light, love, and finally again, life. Genesis 1 begins this way, in the beginning, God, life. Let there be light, light. And God said, let us make man in our own image. That's love. 
And so when we, get, we begin John's gospel, again, we see life. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. It's very important to notice this progression. Life first, then light. Now, love does not appear in John's gospel until the well-known John 3.16. And then as love blossoms in the so-called book of glory, which is John 13 through 21, the word light doesn't appear. But John finally ends with life. The same thing is true of John's epistle. He begins with the, the, uh, that which was from the beginning, the message about the capital L, life. He's actually personifying the Son of God as life at the very beginning of the epistle. Then he says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Then he will go on to talk about God is love. And then he ends again at the very end, and this is the true life, the true eternal life. And so we have life, light, love, and concluding life. The importance of that is that doctrine precedes practice. Truth precedes ethics. Epistemology precedes axiology, if you want philosophical terms. But what that means is, in order to practice righteousness before God, in order to love in a biblical godly way, we must define what those are and learn from the scripture what is really true of righteousness and what is really characteristic of God's love. So we are shed, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit has been given to us and he has shed abroad God's light so that we can understand these important truths and then put them into practice. Now, John is a book about certainties. If you are a true believer, don't be afraid of 1 John, because when you read it, you will become more sure of your salvation. However, if an unbeliever reads 1 John, he will become less sure of the illusion he's living under. So John is a book about certainties. The famous, uh, well, maybe not famous, but the semi-well-known German philosopher Goethe said in loose translation, do not tell me about your doubts. I have doubts enough of my own. Tell me your certainties. Well, if he had read John's first epistle, he would have read about certainties. Nine times John says something like this, by this we know. And so John's giving us knowledge and he gives us also the very purpose for his writing. He says, first of all, I write to you that your joy may be full. So this information giving us truth about our family affairs with God and giving us certainty about our salvation should fill us with joy. Another goal John has, he mentions in chapter two, he says, I write these things unto you that ye sin not. But he's a realist. He says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. But in John chapter five, in a sort of, a sort of climactic statement for the whole book, he says, these things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. So John is a book of certainties. And he wants us to read the book and examine ourselves and pass the three tests that he gives us in the epistle. I'll remind you what those three tests are. There is the test of light in no particular order. I'm just going to take them in this order. The test of light is what do you believe? What is your doctrine? Specifically, what do you believe about the son of God? Is he fully God? Did he come in the flesh? Is he God manifest in the flesh, to use Paul's term? Is he fully divine and fully human? John had to clarify these issues because writing as he did at the end of the first century, already many heretical systems had begun and the early workings of what would later be called Gnosticism were afoot. And so there were people who were denying the deity or denying the humanity of Christ. To pass the first test, you must believe the truth of God's word. And he says, this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. That is from the days when Christ arrived, from the days when he began to, pre to preach the gospel, and from the days that his apostles went forth with that message after Pentecost. That's the beginning he's referring to. That message from the beginning is now the same 
Some 50 years later, and more even, from the time when Christ walked the earth, and the same message, unchanged, is the only message that can save. So we must believe the right things about the Son of God. We also must believe the right things about ourselves. We must believe that we have sinned. This is chapter one. We must believe that we have sinned. We must believe that he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the whole world. We must understand our position as we walk in the light and expose who we are to God and get his cleansing and forgiveness. And so truth matters. And the test of light is what do I believe about Christ and about myself? And about his salvation. The second test is the righteousness test. And this is that those who are true believers will live a righteous life. They don't become Christians or get saved by living a righteous life, but rather because they have been saved, because God's seed is in them, because they are now children like their father, they are going to live like their father would live. They begin to think as he thinks and act as he would act. And so they are to walk even as he, Christ, walked. And that righteousness is a test. And anyone whose life is not consistently righteous is exposed by John as a fraud. You say it's a strong term. Well, um, I'll have a little solace for you in a minute if you're not perfect because I'm not either. But the test is righteous life. The third test is the love test. And that is how do I regard my brothers and sisters? Do I love them? Do I love the father? Do I love his son, Jesus Christ? Do I love my brothers and sisters? We all share the same eternal life. We all walk in the same light. We should all have the same love. And if I do not love my brother, I, then I do not love God. And if I do not love my brother and I do not love God, I do not have eternal life. Now, John is a realist. And he, he really presents the Christian life as a video, not as a snapshot. If you took some snapshots of my life, uh, I would say you might come to the conclusion that I'm not a Christian at all. Because there have been some times, and I suppose there may be more of them in the future, when I'm behaving in a decidedly unloving or unrighteous way. But that is not the tenor of my life. What matters is the video, not an individual frame. And so God looks at the tenor of the life. Has it been changed? And John is very clear about this because he talks about living in the Greek present tense, which is a continuous action, not seen as one event. He also uses the word practice, and practice is a durative word. It clearly implies time. You only can practice things over some set of minutes or hours or days or, or years. And so that suggests very much that we're talking about a video and not a snapshot. He also uses the very suggestive term walk and walking means you've got a course to follow and you begin at one end and you end at the other end and there's everything in between. And that's the Christian life. So John is not preaching sinless perfection. In fact, he says those who believe they are sinlessly perfect are deceived. They're deceiving themselves. The truth is not in them. If any man sin, it shouldn't happen, but it does happen. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, I'd like to divide the epistle into three cycles. This is, again, pretty familiar territory for most of you. John doesn't write in the sort of logical way that Paul writes. Paul writes in a way that probably appeals more to our Western way of organization. But John is writing in a no less organized way, but it's a different organization. It's more of a Hebrew organization of parallelism. If you want to think of it as a symphony, that's helpful because you have the opening introduction and then you have from that theme variations, theme and variations. And so you have three cycles where John is going to continue to advance these three tests of righteousness, love and truth. Righteousness, love, and truth. Righteousness, love, and truth. Now, the first section is the manifestation of the life of God. We have fellowship with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. We have fellowship with one another. 
We have fellowship with the apostles who first presented the gospel after Pentecost. And we have fellowship with all of our brothers and sisters today. And what is fellowship? It is a sharing of a third thing. If you and I are in fellowship, it means we share a third thing. And the third thing that is shared, the tertium quid, as we call it, the third thing is eternal life. I share that with God the Father. I share that with God the Son. I share that with the apostles. I share that with you. You share it with me. We share a common eternal light. We walk in the light. We have fellowship with the Father. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When we confess our sins, which we do as believers, he is faithful and just to forgive us all sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is our relationship with divine persons, sharing the same life that God himself has. This section ends, as all three sections end, with a warning. And the warning is against false Christs, antichrists, who prefigure the capital A antichrist who will come at the end times. These are people who deny the deity of Christ, deny his humanity, deny his saving work. And we need to beware of them. Another thing I want to bring out in these three cycles is that the world, and we're going to talk about what the world means in some detail in a few minutes, the world is presented in a different way in each of the three cycles. In this first section, which goes from chapter 1, verse 1 through 228, so the verses that we read today are in this first section, the world is presented as alluring. The world wants our love. The world wants to attract us to its things. And by doing that, to attract us away from God. So it allures us. Very dangerous thing the world is prone to do. To allure the people of God away from their first love. The second section in John, just briefly as we just survey the epistle for a couple of minutes more. Is from verse 2, 29 rather, of chapter 2 through 4, 6. And now it is not the manifestation of the life of God, but it's the manifestation of the Son of God and of the children of God. In other words, we see the family of God. And it's our resemblance to the Father that really John is going to emphasize in this part of his book. If we are truly children of God, then we are going to behave like God. And the seed of God is in us, the real life of God. So I may have certain characteristics that my father had and some that my mother has. And those are because their genetic material came into me. And in the same way, those who are born of God are genetically linked to God. And therefore, they behave like God behaves or would behave or did behave in the person of his son when he came into the world. So our resemblance to our father is what John wants to emphasize in the second section. And the, this section also ends with a warning, but now it's not beware of false Christs. It's beware of false spirits because there is one spirit of God and every other spirit is a spirit of error. And so John wants us to be aware of that. How does the world come in this second section? The world no longer is seen as alluring. The world is seen as hating because the world hates those who belong to God, the born ones of God. The world has no time for them. And therefore, if we are going to be faithful to God, we will face what Christ faced, the hatred of the world. The third movement in John, and this, with this we conclude our introduction, is from 4.7 through the very last verse, which is 5.21. Here we have not the manifestation of the life of God, or of the family of God, of the son and of the children, but now we have the well-known manifestation of the love of God in this third section. It's about the love of God. And it's our relationships, if you want to think of it this way, to one another, loving each other, governed by righteousness, governed by love, governed by truth. And so this is a section about God's love, not only his love to us, but his love through us. Because no man has seen God at any time, that's true. But the God that they see, that is the characteristics of our heavenly father, are going to be seen in you and in me, his children. So this is a very important section. And it begins with, sorry, ends with a warning against not of false Christs, not false spirits, but against false gods. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And how is the world seen in this third section? 
The world is seen not as what allures us, not as what hates us, but what obstructs us. And the necessity of overcoming is what John is going to talk about. The world will be a block, a hindrance, an impediment to every attempt to live for God. And we must learn to overcome it as Christ overcame the world himself. Now, I want to now turn to this section that we read. I said my theme verse was going to be 15 and 16, two verses. Let's read those again or listen to me read them. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father, but is of the world. And we might as well read the next verse too, because it's very important. And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I want to begin as before we talk about the love of the world versus the love of the father to dwell for a minute on these expressions we have in verse 16, where he says, all that is in the world is defined in three categories. Well known, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life as we have it in the King James Version. We'll talk about uh, what those mean in some detail. I think really that is all of the categories of worldliness and all the areas in which believers go astray. As you know, Christ received three main temptations from the devil, even though that temptation perhaps was not limited to those three, but he was tempted throughout the course of those 40 days and 40 nights. There seems to be a climactic three. And then it says when the devil had finished all his temptations. So this seems to be Satan's whole repertoire exposed three basic categories, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And I want to just talk about those for a minute and see if we can get something practical as we think about how we ourselves need to beware of these realities. First of all, a couple of clarifications. It's very tempting for us, well versed in Romans and Galatians, to consider the flesh in 1 John as something evil. It is not evil. I want you, I challenge you, if you haven't thought of this before, and I'm sure you have, to look at every use of the word flesh in the Gospel of John and in his epistles. It is a morally neutral entity. Much of the time, it is the flesh of Christ, his true humanity, that is being emphasized. I also want to adjust your thinking maybe a little bit about this word lust, because lust to us is a bad thing. It's mainly sexual lust, but the word is simply strong desire. So the desire of the flesh can be wholly legitimate in 1 John. The desire of the flesh, therefore, must strike closer to home than we think. If we think that we've got our minds and our sanctification to a point where we no longer are tempted by the lurid things, I want to remind you that it is the very legitimate things of life that may make us worldly. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Basically, I think we can understand this better if we compare it to some other scriptures that we know about. First of all, obviously the temptation in the Garden of Eden. Eve is going to look at the fruit that the Satan is that Satan is enticing her to eat, and she's going to see that it is good for food. Just as in the wilderness, Christ Hungry now after 40 days, here's the devil say to him, command that these stones be made bread. This is a hunger. This is a desire of the flesh. It is a natural appetite. And natural appetites of the body are not intrinsically evil. It is only the twisted, depraved minds of selfish men and women who turn them into something evil. So that a natural appetite for food is a gift from God. But if my belly is my God or God is my belly, as Paul says in first Corinthians, then I've taken it way too far and I've made it into a, a method of self indulgence. But the first thing we must watch out for is the emphasis on bodily appetites, including legitimate ones 
that we want to exercise instead of our first, our first obligation, which is toward a relationship with God. I think this is really what materialism is all about. Materialism isn't just having 10,000 square foot homes and Rolex watches. Materialism is when we emphasize the material things of life above the spiritual. This is the point in the temptation in the garden, in the, um, in the wilderness with Christ. There's nothing wrong with him having bread. What was wrong with that situation was it was outside of God's will for Christ at that moment. And he says appropriately, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. There is a need for physical food, but there's an even greater need for spiritual food. There's a need to deal with material things, but the first priority in life should always be heavenly things. The physical is important, but the spiritual is more important. The temporal is, is important, but the future is even more important. So it's a matter of priorities. And if we are prioritizing material things, temporal things, physical things above our main priorities as believers, then we are being worldly, even in the most legitimate areas. So it's necessary for us, like Christ, to trust God. The Lord Jesus triumphed, by the way, where Israel failed. Because if you look at Matthew's order in particular, he's showing Christ succeeding in three areas that Israel successively failed in in the book of Exodus. Where did they fail when it came to bread? In Exodus 16, in the wilderness of sin. God did rain down manna, but it was his grace that provided the manna because they did not trust God to provide them for their daily bread. And they grumbled against God and they grumbled against Moses. And out of his grace, God gave them bread from heaven. But when the Lord Jesus was presented with the same temptation, he triumphed gloriously where Israel had failed. Let us learn to seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. Let us learn to trust God for our material things and to enjoy material things because he has given us all things richly to enjoy in fellowship with him. And we'll say more about that in a little bit. But let's turn on to the next uh, section here or the next type of temptation. And that's the desire of the eyes. Now, while the temptations that come from the desires of the flesh can be legitimate things that are turned into illegitimate ones. When it comes to the desires of the eyes, we're in a more dangerous area. There are things that you can see with your eyes that may be legitimate for you, but it is so easy to succumb to images and to your imagination and to your emotions, which are stirred by what comes in through the eye gate. William Blake, of course, uh, an English poet, I would say well-known, although these days such people are not always well-known, but he said, this life's dim windows of the soul, and by that he's referring to the eyes, distorts the heaven from pole to pole and leads you to believe a lie when you see with and not through the eye. What Blake was saying was, the eye is a very dangerous instrument because if you let all that it sees come in unfiltered, unvarnished, unjudged, uncriticized, and simply accept the images as they wash over you, you are going to succumb to the desires of the eyes. The eyes are very important, but they should be used as a tool and they should be used critically. Therefore, according to Blake, you should see through your eyes and not merely with your eyes. And so this is a very important thing because as Christ, as Eve, let's go back, let's follow this in order. As Eve looked at that fruit, she saw that it was beautiful. It was beautiful. God had made it. Satan showed Christ a panorama of all the kingdoms of the earth. He said, these can all be yours if you just bow down and worship me. Just a little genuflection. It doesn't need to be a very long thing. Just a little bit of homage to me, and I'll give them all to you because I received them all when Adam fell and yielded them to me. And so this is a very tempting thing for humans to see beautiful, alluring, and attractive things with their eyes. But if we do that in a way that dishonors God or leaves God out, 
It's worldliness. Israel failed. The failure here is with the golden calf. When Moses was up on the mountain, they said, we don't know what's become of this man. And so they decided to make their own images and to do what felt right to them and to indulge in false worship. But Christ triumphed in the desert because he said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. He rebuked the devil for the very thought that anyone would live in a way that would not be worshipful toward the God who had given such a rich bounty to enjoy. And so I think it's important for us in an age of images to remember that images are dangerous things. They can be very illuminating. They can a picture is worth a thousand words. They often say and with the ability to see things that are in other lands or in other times is really wonderful. There was a time when all of that was not available and we only had the cold uh, print on a piece of paper. However, images cannot give you propositional truth. Images cannot give you absolute truth. Images don't convey rational things at all. They simply wash over you and are entirely subjective and play on your emotions. And if you let your emotions rule your life rather than your thinking, if you let what feels good ride over what is good, according to biblical standards, then you're worldly and you have succumbed to the lust of the eyes. Thank God our Lord Jesus triumphed where Israel had failed. And we can triumph too if we understand the temptation that we need to critically look at everything that comes in through eye gate and make sure that we only accept what comports with the word of God. The third area is the pride of life, it's called, or the pride of possessions. Here to continue our links with Genesis and the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. In Genesis, this was a fruit that was desired to make one wise. Now, we're not dealing now with a body in the first case or with the emotional soul as in the second case. But now we're dealing with the spirit of man and its tendency toward pride. And there's nothing good in this category. There's no legitimacy in the pride of life. Now, the pride of life is a difficult phrase. Uh, it's a translation of something that might better be um, written as pride of possessions. The life being referred to here is not so much the biological life, but the trappings of human living. And it could be I am proud of my possessions, or perhaps more likely, I'm proud in my possessions. Possessions. In other words, because of what I have amassed, because of all the good things that I have and I can do, I declare a state of independence from God. I have a certain autonomy. I have the right to promote myself because I've earned it. I have all of these things and they are the source of my pride. Now, this is a very dangerous human tendency. Of course, this is where the devil himself had fallen. And now he plays on Eve and he says, if you only take this fruit, you'll be like God. You'll be able to discern good from evil. Maybe even come up with your own standards of what is good and what is evil. You do not need God anymore. You should promote yourself. It's all about myself. Now, the word pride in uh, Aladzonea in Greek, which is a word for a braggart, a pretentious person, a person who is prating about himself. A big talker. It's very obnoxious to meet these people, but I guess at some time you are that person and so am I. We need to be very careful of what we're proud of. What did we ever have that we did not receive? You may be, I, I'm in a privileged place of being uber educated. And uh, I was raised with the truth of the scriptures presented in a way that I think is very, very uh, let me say, I'm very grateful for the assembly truth that I was given, it's fed with a spoon. If I'm ever proud of that and believe that makes me somebody special, I'm worldly. I can dress in the most conservative suit. I can use the right prayer pronouns and the right version. And I can look the part of the conservative Christian. But I'm as worldly as anything and as anyone. If pride has gripped my heart. So let's beware of this. This is narcissism. 
if the first one was materialism, too much emphasis on material things, and the second was relativism, subjectivism, uh, failing to moor images into divine truth. This third one is all about narcissism. It's about promoting self. Now, Israel failed big time in this one in the wilderness at Rephidim, Exodus 17. Again, in Matthew's order, you could go Exodus 16, Exodus 17, and Exodus 31, and you would have a nice progression. Luke will change the order because he's not so much interested in the history of the children of Israel as Matthew is. But in this case, at Rephidim, it wasn't merely that they were complaining, but they were insolent. The place was later called Massah, which means testing. They tested the Lord. They put him to the test. It's called Merivah, which means striving, contention. They insolently accused God and proudly put themselves in a position of judging God. But when Christ was in the wilderness, he said to Satan, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so he triumphed where Israel failed. So let's be aware that we can be proud of things that we have been given and somehow take credit for them and live in judgment of other people or contemptuous of those who have less and look religious on the outside, but be as worldly as worldly can be on the inside. I want to now get in the next couple of minutes to the essence of what worldliness really is. I, we should, perhaps I should have done this already. We should come up with a definition of world as we're using it in this love, not the world phrase. After all, God created the world and pronounced it very good. So why should we not love it? John 3.16 says God so loved the world. So why should we not love it? Could it be that the world means more than one thing? Well, of course it does. And this is one characteristic of John's writings to have nuanced meanings to the same word. Famously, we have that verse in the first chapter of the gospel. He was in the world. The world was made by him and the world did not know him. Now, those are really three different meanings for the word world. He was in the world could mean he was on the planet or perhaps he was in the midst of human culture without respect to whether it was sinful or not, just among people. The world was made by him must mean the planet or perhaps even the whole cosmos. But the world that knew him not is the world of sinful men, a world organized against God. So you have three different meanings of the word world and you have to disambiguate them. This is what we call equivocation. So you have to come up with your contextual meaning of the word world in the passage you're considering. After all, if we think of the world in the broadest sense, God has given us all things richly to enjoy. And we saw this in the garden because Eve was given and Adam all things richly to enjoy. God put one prohibition because he wanted to test their allegiance to him and remind them that all of this blessing and largesse that they were enjoying was because of his grace to them. And he wanted to be a part of their life. Now, of course, Eve looks at this fruit and she sees it's beautiful. She sees it's good for food. She thinks it'll make her wise. So she gets aesthetic satisfaction. Nothing wrong with aesthetics. She gets physical satisfaction. Again, nothing wrong with satisfying physical appetites legitimately. And she gets intellectual satisfaction. And what's wrong with that? The wrongness here is that the devil was using the world to lure her affections away from God and to get her to take her eye off of God. And that is the essence of worldliness. Worldliness is not about so much what you wear. It is not about external things. Worldliness is about your affections. Worldliness is what you love. Because it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Worldliness is about affections. You may have a big car. Maybe you have two of them. Maybe a Mercedes and a Lotus. And I look at you and I say, you're worldly because I'm jealous. Maybe. But if you are using those cars for the glory of God, if you are walking closely with the Lord, 
if you are living a life of sanctification. If you worship the Lord your God and include him in every part of your life. Then who am I to call you world? It's not about the vehicles. It's about your heart. And I'm driving my Ford Focus. And I have to turn the air conditioning off in order to main speed when I'm going uphill. And I may think that's a humble car and that makes me unworldly. But it doesn't. The question is what's going on in my heart? What do I love? So the devil used the world to take Eve's affection away from himself, from God rather, and to bring it to the world and to enjoying things apart from God. Imagine if I had a son and I saved up a lot of money and I sent him to driving school and then I bought him a very expensive car because I'm trying to build a relationship with this boy and I give him the keys and he gets in the car and starts the ignition, rolls down the window and says, see you, dad, I'm never coming back. How does that make me feel? That's exactly what our first parents did in the Garden of Eden. They were to receive God's blessings and enjoy it with him. God was to be a part of their life, a part of everything they did, even the mundane things. And they were to return thanks to the Lord. So it came from God and in that sense it went back to God. And it was a God centered life of enjoyment of all of the things that God had blessed them with. But they turned on the ignition waved goodbye and said we're going to enjoy this apart from you and that is worldliness. And that cuts pretty close. That hits pretty close to home doesn't it? Because we're all worldly in that way we exclude God even the best of Christians do. And some of the things that we go in to enjoy. And so let's be very, very careful. That's why I actually think, by the way, if you care about my opinions about things, that PG-13 movies are the most dangerous of all. You say, you're crazy. That's the R and the X-rated ones that are the real danger. I don't know. You say, I go to Dr. Dobson's website to make sure the movies my kids watch are clean. Well, that's good. But then your kid watches a movie where the Beaver family enjoys wonderful supper times together and they go out into the yard and play and they go on vacation and they do all the wonderful things that you might do in your life and God is absent. There's no prayer. There's no God. There's no worship. There's no Bible. Life is good apart from God. That's worldliness. We need to be careful that these messages even at that level, don't come to our children that it's perfectly fine to live without God. You can believe in him, but he's not part of your daily life. If God is not part of your daily life and involved with your activities, then you are worldly. And John says, love not the world. To pursue anything legitimate apart from God is worldliness. Now, clearly worldliness is all the things that you always thought it was. All the bad things, all the lurid things, all the ungodly things that are in the world. And those are also a danger to us. But let us not limit it to those things or we'll get too comfortable. It includes every legitimate thing in life enjoyed exclusive of God and enjoyed without thanksgiving to God. So close fellowship with God is the cure for worldliness. And when God is loved, everything else takes care of itself. We don't have to worry about rules about how people dress or about where they go or what they do because those things will be corrected by walking in the light and by walking in constant acknowledgement of God. So I'm going to I'm going to conclude with a comparison of Exodus and the Gospel of John to show how John emphasizes this point by comparing Christ to Moses. Exodus and the Gospel of John are very, very close parallels. And this gets, gives us a hint into John's thinking, even though we're talking about his first epistle today. Exodus tells us about a prince of Egypt. It tells us about bondage of the people of God. It tells us about the coming of a deliverer. It tells us that the, that deliverer's main task was to declare the name of the Lord to the people. And that his position was affirmed by miraculous signs. 
It shows how there was a deliverance through the Passover and God brought his people out into a special place in the wilderness where he would feed them with bread and he would fellowship with them as they headed toward a promised land. And you're with me now. This is exactly the flow in the Gospel of John. We have the prince of this world. Christ said of him, he cometh and hath nothing in me. We have the coming of a deliverer. And he says, I have declared your name unto them and will declare it. Christ came to declare the name of God. And in so doing, he was authenticated with signs just as Moses was. And then he brought about that great deliverance through the fulfillment of Passover at the cross. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Christ brings his own into the upper room. And he shows them the things to come. And they anticipate fellowship with him as they head toward the father's house where there are many mansions. It's a very close parallel. Now I want you to catch the important thing I think in each of these wonderful books. Declaring of the name of God. We want to bring people into the knowledge of God, which is eternal life to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. We want people to be brought into the blessing of eternal life and to begin to walk with God and to have God part of their lives and to be apart from the world in that sense. So the Christian life is a linear life. The worldlings life is a cyclical life. People are born, they live and they die. People go around in circles with no origin that they will acknowledge and no telos, no end, no goal in their life. But Christianity defines his, and this is how history is defined by other people and other cultures. It's all the circle of life. But the Bible's not circular, the Bible is linear. It's linear in its history, Genesis to Revolution, Revelation, excuse me, and it is also linear in every one of our lives. We begin at a point where we enter by the straight gate. We, we follow the narrow path that leads to life. Along the way, we walk with God. We have a clear goal in mind, and we have, therefore, joy in the present and purpose and meaning in the future. And we have this wonderful message to declare, to declare rather, that it is possible to live a life where everything is enjoyed in fellowship with God. That's how we can live and not be worldly. So let's be careful that we don't love the world exclusive of God, because if we truly love the world, the love of the father is not in us. Why does it say the father? Well, the devil is very much interested in distracting us from Christ. The flesh is very interested in warring against the spirit. But it is the world that goes after the father. Because the father made the world and the father gave it to his children and they betray him when they take his good gifts and enjoy them apart from him. You say, well, that's a challenge. How can I learn to love God more? I, if I hear what you're saying, to be unworldly is simply not to divorce myself from worldly things. It is to develop an affection for God in place of any affection for the world. And that is true. So how do you how do you generate more love for God? How do you muster that up? You sit down and try. You ever tried to love God more in your chair? I think God, John gives us the answer. It says he tells, tells us in the fourth chapter, we love because he first loved us. When Christ declared the name of the father to us, we understood that there was a loving God and we learned that he was the creator of all things. And we learned that he is glorious and magnificent. And we learned that he is full of grace. And we learned that he has a future for us and a hope. And we become those who love the father. And we become those who desire to be in the father's house. And before we get there, someday in the present, we're going to live in fellowship with our father. And we're not going to let the world take that away from us. We are going to focus on the fact that he first loved us. So if you want to love God more, don't try. Just spend time thinking about how much God loves you. And be, rap be enraptured, be ravished, be overcome, be overwhelmed 
by the fact that God ever deigned to look on you and look on me. And may we all ask this question of God, maybe pray to him. Father, is there anything of the many gifts that you have given me that is stealing my affection away from you? Is there anything in the world where I am that is making me love you less? If it is, help me to remove it and help me to focus on your love for me. Remember, no man can serve two masters. He will love the one and hate the other. He will cleave to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. That's true. In our case, you cannot serve. You cannot love the father and the world. And therefore, may we all go in for loving God. Thank you very much for listening. And I pray that this message may be a blessing to you as it has been for, to me as I've challenged myself thinking about it.